Okay, Maria, are you happy for us to crack on? Sure, of course. Sure. Okay. So welcome everybody to today. Um, I'll pass you over to Maria first in case she wants to say anything from the ISM. Um, just welcome and I hope you enjoy and um, I'll hand over to you. Go ahead. Brilliant. Um, Emily's just changing computers, so she's asked if we can just switch order. Nick, I wonder if you might be just, you know, willing to jump straight in there. Why not? <laughs> I'm just gonna, I'll introduce you whilst, whilst, you're, um, whilst okay. you're doing that. Uh, Emily, just send us a message when you're ready. That's great. So Nick is head of performing the Performing Arts Faculty at Rother Smythe Academy in Market Harbour, and he's going to talk about DAWs for life and not just for filler or for Christmas, I imagine. So... Yeah, it was a bit of a rubbish title, to be fair. <laughs> I was going back over this and thinking, oh, it's a rubbish title, but I had to type it into the presentation nonetheless. Um, yeah, I when I've done presentations like this before, I tend to fit lots in and then um, really kind of gabble at the end. So I've tried to actually keep my content fairly light on this one. So uh, hopefully I won't be told to be cut off and things like that. So just to, um, if this is going to work. There we go. Right, it does work. Brilliant. So I'm Nick, um, Head of Performing Arts at the Robert Smythe Academy, which is in Market Harbour in Leicestershire. We're part of the Tudor Grange Academies Trust, which has got schools in from Worcester, Solihull, Leicester, Market Harbour as well. I'm also the ASM Music Technology Principal Examiner for the Composition Music Tech paper, which means I create the paper, write the paper, and I'm in charge of the marking of the paper. Um, I mean, obviously, I'm Listen, imagine, and compose. I do that, which is the masters. Uh, I think a few people here have already done that as well. Working with Birmingham City University and Martin Faultley and Sound and Music. Um, so that's me. And I just wanted to. I was asked to do something, and I just thought I'd focus on something that I've spoke about before. A listen, uh, listen, imagine, compose session previously, and I just thought I'd expand on it. So if you have been at that session and seen this before, I am sorry. Um, but I think it's just, I wanted to talk through some composing, creative composing door things that I do, which it's not door specifics. So you don't have to say, oh, I haven't got a garage band, I can't do that. Or I haven't got logic, I can't do that. You can do this with kind of any of them and adapt them as you see fit. So I'm conscious of time, so I'm gonna get my watch off. So I thought I'd just go through really um, things that I do. Um, and I wanted to do key stage three, four and five. And primarily with key stage three, I think the main thing that I will kind of want to get across is a lot of it's just learning how to use the kit. Um, I'm teaching far more music than I would um, music tech, so to speak, or music production. Um, obviously you get the odd student here or there. So I'm just going to minimize this because that's doing my head in. Um, the odd student who, who will, you know, um, show some interest and you can, you know, deviate and show them new techie things if you wish. Um, but the main thing that I do kind of go on is this idea of always, even just basic pressing play, how to edit the notes, how to move the notes around, uh, how to navigate the software, how to get out of the, the arrange window. And, and the other thing as well that I often try to teach is just, just the trimming the regions, because trimming the regions in a, in a draw in a sequencer, if you don't do that correctly, it, it all gets into chaos. And the other thing as well with Key Stage 3, which is what I do, which I tell other I recommend that the teachers do is always provide them a template file. Um, I spent years giving them, telling them, showing them how to open up the software, uh, particularly Key Stage 3, and it just, it just all falling apart. So I just give them a template file. It's got everything in there, and all they've got to do is click on the things and either play it in, record it in, or click directly in. So that's kind of Key Stage 3. Really, I want to focus on Key Stage 4 and 5 for what I do. And the first thing I wanted to talk about is using the piano roll as the notation. Um, yes, it's on the top there. Piano roll as notation. Um, I started to do this with lower ability students, um, or not lower ability students. That's 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 not correct at all. Um, students who found that uh, traditional notation was a barrier, and uh, they they have very good ears as well. And um, and as soon as I started to do this, it really was like a breakthrough moment for me. Um, and this is feature of work. This is from lockdown three. This is um, this is a student who plays bass guitar, I believe, or is this? No, this one is a um, this one is a singer, and it was to do with extended chords. So visually showing them how you stack 
an extended chord up rather than showing them how to do it through um, conventional music notation. I know that sounds quite obvious, but it really was a breakthrough moment for me and the students who were involved in that, just showing them that idea of stacking up triads. Um, and, you know, she came up with a chord sequence, one chord per bar. I know it sounds really simple. This is at year nine for our key stage four slash key stage three, whatever you want to call it. Um, and this, that we're talking about inversions. And exactly, this is a bass guitarist. Um, she doesn't read a dot of music. She was able to get some chord extensions in there, in inversion, mapped out in a chord sequence, um, which obviously for GCSE, um, having chord extensions in a chord sequence is lovely. Thank you very much. Um, so it's not, it, it's using the door as a notation tool. Um, and that's the one thing that I've really, really, I, I love doing now because it really does break down barriers. The main thing about this session that I wanted to focus on today, which I had a lot of good feedback on previously, was this idea of composition consequences. Now, I pinched this idea of um, Dr. Kirsty Devaney, um, and she said she pinched it off somebody else, so I don't feel quite so bad. <laughs> so... Um, and, I, and I've done it, I do this with different year groups um, and I'm using year nine and then a music tech year 13, um, different version. It's great for all abilities. Um, it's a big team effort. It opens up inquiring minds and then we have a listening party at the end. So how it works is um, they all sit down at a computer in the room. They log on, they open up a session. We use Cubase. So they open up a Cubase session um, and then what I tell them to do is, so let's just go through the year nine one first. Um, I'll come back to these bits on the side here. It does take long to do this, but I'll come back to it. And I'll put this up on the board. And it will just say, create a full chord, chord sequence, explore extended chords where possible, explore rhythm on the part, choose a tempo, record or click the part into Cubase, copy and paste it out four times. It's basically create a chord sequence. And I'll put, then they'll, they'll spend, year nine will probably spend 20, up to 20 minutes, some of them working on that, getting it in, copying and pasting it out four times. Obviously, I've shown them how to use the software previously. This is a building on task. Um, and then what happens is, and this is the, the essence of how it works, is they go file, save as, they save the session. Then they stand up and then they move to the computer to their right. So they stand up and they then go to the next computer and then they sit down and they listen to the calls that the person next to them has made. And then I tell them to turn around and then this goes up. Over the top of that chord sequence they've just inherited, they've then got to create a drum beat. Again, there's a lot of words on here because this is to help guide my students because this is how I teach how to write a drum beat. Um, I want them to click in a drum beat that complements the chords at the same tempo, so they're not changing tempo. Again, basic rules, snare clap on two and four, kick on one, hat similar in every bar. You may wish to or triplets if you want. You can write in any style for those of those who think I want to write in a drum and bass style in year nine because that only happens every now and again, but they can. Then they save it, they stand up, they move to the next computer along. They go along, then they're inherited now, a drum beat, a chord sequence, and they've got to write a bass line to what they're listening to. So then they're going to create a suitable bass timbre. Again, I suggest keeping the part rhythmical and don't rely on long sustained notes. Only use notes from the chords that are sounding in that bar. So they need to look at the parts that they've inherited. So they need to look at the chord or chords that are involved. Um, and then I've mentioned try using passing notes as an extension for those. If they want to just pick one note, the root note, they can do. But it, it, it forces them to look at the chords. So they're not just randomly clicking in notes to create a bass line. And they get it, they save it, they stand up, they move along to the right. And then there's a riff. They write a riff, blah, blah, blah. So on it goes on. What's the next one? Editing, um, texture. So if they've got a huge load of blocks in their um, in their sequencer now, they're going to go and they're going to start stripping things out. They're going to create layers. They're going to think about dynamics. They're going to think about structure um, regarding that as well. They're going to have to use copy and paste. They save it. They stand up. They move to the right. Drum fills. I mean, I've taken some out. I've put some in. It does, it, you, you just tweak it. Um, I don't think we actually got to drum fills when I did this last time with the and I. Um, so they get up drum fills. What else could you do? Effects. I think I took drum fills out and we did effects. Again, reverbs, delays, flange, chorus. Be musical though and don't overdo it. Huh. Explore automation if you can. Oh, that was 
that was adventurous of me. We didn't get that far. And then eventually they get back to their own. You add more in and, you know, you can take things out. You can just tweak it to how many there are. I think I abandoned this one, actually. Um, not with the previous year nine that group. I think previous one to that. Not the one just gone, the one before. I, I abandoned after, like, I think I got to drum fills and just went, oh, we, we haven't got time. Right, everyone just go back to their machine. And they listen to what's become of it. And it's really useful um, because they hear where their simple chord sequence went what became of it, and then they can go around, then we have a listening party. So then they go back and they listen and they listen to each other's, oh, who did this bit, who did that bit? And what it does is, particularly for year nine, it lowers the stakes, because so many of my students, particularly if they've not had much experience of composing on their own, they've done a lot of group composing in year seven and eight and not much at primary, um, there's a lot of anxiety about it, particularly when they compare themselves to other people in the class. And this just completely lowers the stakes because they're doing this as a whole kind of mass group. Um, and again, I do find with year nine, having to go over previously taught material um, is key. There is a lot of repetition involved, but it is good and they love doing it. They love doing it. I'm not saying that enjoying something means they learn something out of it, but the fact that they're enjoying it, their anxiety levels aren't through the roof for those students who'd feel less confident composing. Because so I don't think there's lower ability composers. I think there's less confident composers and there's more confident composers. And then you can stretch it. So here's my year 12, 13, uh, music tech one for the A-level. Um, the pacing is much quicker. You can have more tasks. Um, due to the above, the levels of interest and excitement are higher. They really love doing this because they've got, oh, I'm not going to use that knowledge term. They've got more experience. They've got more experience of using the software. They've got more experience of um, listening to music of different styles of music. Um, and yeah, they really get a lot out of this because they, they often look at each other in year 12 and 13 in this kind of like idolizing kind of way, some of them. And this way they get to collaborate. It's like doing like collaborating online, but in a room, who'd have thought it actually in the same room, crazy. So and you can go as complex or not as you want. So this was uh, this was a fairly high ability year music tech group. Create a chord patch from scratch using a synth, use a square saw wave to start, use ADSR, oscillate its filters, filter ADSR noise, sculpt a sound, record it in, choose a tempo. Then there's the drum beat part, it's similar. You can use multi-sample synth sounds, sound it over the chord sequence at the same tempo, Make interesting use of snap to grid and possibly triplets. You can write in any drum style. Baseline, same type of thing, but create a growling synth baseline. Keep the musical part rhythmical. Start with the saw square way, make use of filters. So you, I'm building on what they've, what I know they know. I mean, I'm not expecting, this isn't a template you could take and map into your class. This is just stuff that I know I've taught them and I know they've used before. Um, and it's just reminding them that they can obviously go through it. What else we got? Editing. Yeah, yeah, it's the same thing. But I think that's kind of the main thing. Yeah, effects. What's this? Yeah, there's less instruction on this one compared to the other one. So don't be liberal. You utilize automation so that effects are coming in and out of the track. And it gives them a chance to focus on one particular thing almost on somebody else's work because it is somebody else's work. And they're adding to that um, and so on and so forth. So come back out of there there we go brilliant so that's something that i've been using and i know other people have commented that they've enjoyed using this um particularly with composing and you could try it with all sorts of stuff but it's really nice having a classroom where you're watching them and they stand up and they're just rotating around uh it's like they it's like, it's like they come across a little problem they come across a new problem each time um which is great because really some people argue composing is just problem solving i kind of get that and that that, that's what that does. It's a new problem each time that they come across. Um, again, this idea of peer feedback, again, moving around, yeah, peer feedback, moving around the computers. So if they've been working on a composition task, this is something different now. Um, if they've been working on a composition task for, I don't know, weeks, lessons, months, whatever. Um, I mean, peer feedback, I have mixed feelings about it, but I think it's interesting to have confirmation from your peers about what's working and what's not so i just put a piece of paper down on their desk they stand up they move to the right and they have to then listen to what they're li listening to somebody else's work and they write down one thing they like two things that that person could do or work on next or where they could take it next and then they're going to write thing one thing down that they're going to pinch 
or steal for their own work. Um, then they fold it over. So the person coming along doesn't see the same thing. They move along to the next one. And eventually they get up right, and they, they, they love doing this because they get to everybody else's work. And then when they get back to their own, they've got like two sides of A4 of people saying what they think about their work, whether it's good, what they should do next. There might be common themes about what needs to be worked on, gives them a clear direction. And also it gives you them confirmation about which bits are working and why. Um, that's really successful, particularly with year 11, maybe 10, not 10 to a certain extent, year 11 getting to the end of their summative uh, composition tasks and obviously 12 and 13 as well. How are we doing for time? Not too bad. Um, and then I put some extra bits and bobs on there, which are just a bit of fun, breakbeats. I always teach the history of breakbeats. Just get a really cool breakbeat off the internet, a drum break, drum loop, stick it into any, any, anything at all. Um, try and match the tempo if you can and get the tempo right. And then just slice it up on the transients um, and then move it around. Again, this is band lab. I've not done a great job of slicing that up. It's halfway through the transient, but you can move them around, reorder them, copy and paste them. It's great for creating stuttery drum beats. You know, you can get some really cool, really cool drum beats just out of that. You just take a drum loop in, match the tempo. I think this is the funky drummer from James Brown. And again, it's 96 BPM. I've matched that. It's not quite on the grid, but I've slapped this together quickly. Um, last time I did this, but that that's, I've had so much success with that as a task. Um, and again, you can go in depth or not in depth as much as possible. And then doors as well, limits and resources. Um, if you are, we're, we're not allowed phones in our school and we haven't had for, we haven't for three years. If you are one of those schools who allow phones in their schools, they're perfect for recording samples. Um, create a piece for toilet and piano without touching the keys. I think I pinched that off Flory. Um, but, you know, you can go and record the sounds of a toilet and then record the sounds of a piano without touching the keys. And you can get acousmatic electroacoustic type pieces out of those, um, reversing, time stretching, pitch shifting, EQing sounds. I haven't done this with year 11. Um, I have done it with year 10. It works really, really well. Um, but then it's hard because I, I feel like with year 10, I don't really sit on it that much as I would like to, because there's always that pressure. Oh, I've got to get through the set works. Oh, we've got to get performances. Oh, we've got to get compositions. And it's like, well, they're never gonna, well, they, well, some of them might have some acousmatic sounds in their GCSE composition. Chances are most of them are gonna be in Sibelius or you know, doing basic sequencing. But you know, year 12 and 13, that's a real great one to do. Um, and I think that's my 10 minutes done so how are we doing ali is that yeah, all right good. Thank, thank you so much that's absolutely brilliant wow what a treasure trove of ideas absolutely stacks of things in there that thing you were saying about um you know getting them to move on and do something on everybody else's composition i've done that a lot with art stuff and and it takes away that um fear of i can't draw and i'm useless at this yeah. becomes something collaborative and that everybody does and i could really see that i really do want to do that i think that's a brilliant brilliant idea we've probably got a couple of minutes for um questions if there's any uh, questions i should have said at the beginning actually if anybody's got anything to say then um you know put some questions up and, and obviously things will come back to people as we go through as well um but if not then we'll um we'll move on to emily and come back to questions after we've had a chat because you're mean to generate some questions as well um so if that's all right we'll do that can't see anything coming up at the minute um thank you nick just so many ideas hopefully um yeah people can take stuff away and i'm sure they'll want to ask you different things as we go along as well if that's all right with you all oh, good brilliant right i want to introduce you to emily um we're delighted today that um emily boxer who's deputy principal of silver town oasis academy um has uh has joined us as well so over to you emily hi everyone can you see my screen ali and can you hear me yes all good Great, so nice to meet you all. Um, I know a couple of you, but um, yeah, great to meet the rest of you. So yeah, I'm, um, I, I was a music teacher and head of music at um, Harris Academy Greenwich um, for a fair few years. And then I've been at Silvertown for the last five years as assistant um, principal and now deputy principal, um, but leading and overseeing music as well. So before I get into thinking about how we work with others, I thought I'd just show you some of our context um, just so that you know sort of how we're working because I think sometimes we hear these things and it um, it feels like we couldn't do that here because we don't have all those things so just so you know 
um, we have one music room. This is it, um, one classroom. And that's how we're set up. And we, we are very lucky with resources. We, well, well, we've worked hard to get lots of resources, but it is just one room. And then we use corners of other rooms. This is a corner of um, like an intervention room for reading, but we sometimes manage to get a bit of music in there. And um, this is my office where I am at the moment. Um, which has a drum kit and a piano in it as well, which we use as much as we can for music. Um, this is the hall and you can see we've got like a band set up in the corner. Um, so we can try and make as much music happen when the hall's available. Um, and um, yeah, in the academy of about 380 students um, from year seven to 11, we don't go up to post 16. Um, and we have about 20 to 30 percent of GCSE uptake each year. We just run GCSE. If we get bigger, and then I'd love to run GCSE and a vocational course, but at the moment it's OCR GCSE. So that's sort of who we are and, and where we're up to. Um, and I'm just thinking today about how we make our musical offer really diverse by working with other people. And in Oasis, we have this messy O, we call it, at the beginning of our Oasis logo. And the messy O is like a deliberate sort of symbol of inclusion. It's a deliberately messy O because um, things are messy when we genuinely include everybody. And so that's how I want our music offer to be. We want it to be for everyone. We want to, everyone to be drawn into music making, to connect with music, to get good at it and to feel and to know it's for them. And I do think working with other people is one of the ways that we can do that. I don't know about you, but I... I find that in some schools, in many schools and academies, music isn't actually very inclusive. It's either explicitly exclusive and you can only do music if you're into a certain type of music or if you're really good or you've had lessons outside of school or it's accidentally exclusive because it's not taught in a rigorous way or a really genuinely inclusive way that means that everybody can do really well. So, um, just in thinking about how we make music inclusive, well, I don't know as well if you've heard students make comments like this, the people leading it don't look like me, or it's too hard, um, or they don't do my music. Music's not for me. Yeah, I know, Miss, music's good, but it's not for me. Um, or I like listening to music, but I don't like it in school. I don't know about you, but I, I've heard comments like that, which are so upsetting and not what we want. Um, and so, Having um, done a lot of thinking about this, I do think that how we work with other people is one of the ways that we can make music more inclusive and draw people in and feel that it is for them. So um, a few ways that I think, the three sort of steps that I think we can take. So first of all, knowing our own limits. Second, looking at our reality. And then thirdly, taking action. And so firstly, I suppose this is just about the reality of ourselves. Like I think we can make a big difference when we are honest and look at ourselves and who we are and what we can offer. Because while I'm sure we're all brilliant practitioners and our students love working with us, we're all, we, there is a sort of limit to who we are and what we can do and what we can offer. And, and I think we need to consider like, what are our instrumental skills? And while I can sort of kind of play a little bit of several different instruments, um, I, I've got to know where my where my limits are and, and where I'll where I will be able to have real impact and where I, someone else might have more. My limit in terms of my race, we're all only one race and we work with lots of different students. Our musical taste and, and how that might impact positively, but also be limited. Our age, our gender, our religions, the thing. And I, I don't know about you, but I, I find I work with some people who work with our young people who just connect with our students in a way that they get them excited and makes them feel loved and passionate about doing music. And you can't always put your finger on what the thing is, um, but actually some, sometimes you find other people that really have that thing with certain students and, and we've got to know our limits. Um, I suppose our students don't need a perfect person who has all of these things in exactly the right way, but I suppose more different people can role model music making and can help build great relationships, can give more attention, um, can help children to connect with someone making music who looks like them and can broaden our musical offer and provide other ways into music for our children. And that's, for us, that's been really important because as you've seen, we're quite limited in what we 
we've got here at Silvertown and also in the, uh, the number and type of staff that we have. So the second step, I think, once we've sort of acknowledged our limitations is looking at our reality. And, and for us here, it's um, two white women um, and um, with kind of a mostly classical background and a little bit of popular music. Um, and that's great. There's nothing wrong with that, but it is a very particular thing. And so I suppose I think it's it's so important that we look at our reality and what we can offer that's great, but also what the reality is in terms in for our students and what else could make a difference. And then it's about, I think, taking action. And I think there's sort of four key areas that I th that we've we've tried and we're working on um, in terms of working with others so that our music offer is really diverse. So first of all, freebies and quick wins. And some of these will hopefully work for you and others might not, but hopefully useful ideas sort of put in the toolkit for when, when they do become possible. Um, I love having PGCE students. And obviously we have PGCE students because we care about training teachers, but also every extra musician who walks through that door is someone else to connect with and to inspire our young people and to make a different type of music with them. We've got um, a brilliant PGC student at the moment who's a fantastic pianist and has for his whole life played um, in gospel choirs and sung um, with brilliant other brilliant musicians and is a real expert in that field which neither me nor my other full-time um, music teacher colleague is and so our students are really benefiting from the wealth of that different experience. Um, and teaching assistants from other teachers, we've worked, um, we've found real, real benefit from tapping into um, secret musicians within the school. We've got, um, previously I worked with a brilliant um, LS, LSA who um, was loved singing and she helped run choir with me and brought a whole different, she was into really different music to me and brought a whole different um, range of um, musical expertise and a different relationship with the students to the choir and it was they they lots of them came because of her and it was brilliant to, to work with her so that's another way in i found and then joining up with other organizations um we work close to a um, youth work organization who have managed to get lots and lots of funding and they have funding that they need to spend and if we manage to align ourselves with them that and persuade them that how they should spend their funding is on employing someone to come in and run a band or employing someone to come in and do a music technology session or um, a rap school um, then actually it's a win-win for both of us they want to spend our money and we need it but I suppose it's about being proactive to find that possibility and then say yes and quickly and this is like one of my biggest rules, I guess, for how we work with others, which is there actually are loads of organizations who offer free or really, really cheap um, provision, but it's it's often sort of limited. And so um, whenever I get an email about anything like that, I reply straight away and say, yes. And I think I'll work out how to make it work later. I'll work out the logistics and I'll, I'll check on the loud later, but I'm gonna reply and say yes straight away. Um, so that we can definitely get the provision for our students. So they're my top tips on freebies and quick wins. Um, the second one is on recruitment. And I think um, when we're thinking about um, a more diverse, a broader offer, um, it's about definitely looking for alignment of values. So when I speak with my Perrys and they come into school, I'm less interested in um, are they like me or what music are they into? But we talk about the values around like meeting children where they're at with the music that they love first of all, and then stretching our students. And that's something that's really important to us here. Um, and previously when I was in a department with um, two classically trained music teachers, um, we looked really hard for a music teacher who was trained through the popular music group so that we could have as much breadth within our department as possible. And then thirdly, if you have money, and obviously lots of us don't, but if you do, um, then I suppose it's finding clever ways of spending it. Uh, it's really expensive, isn't it, to try and get people in um, for a workshop. You know, it can be two, three hundred pounds just for an afternoon. But a, a great way of spending less money on a great provision I've found is to pay our Perry teachers to stay on for an extra hour. So it's just the hourly rate rather than the huge and workshop rate to run a club. So for example, our drummer at the moment stays on and runs a band club. Um, and he brings like a professionalism because he's in a band 
and he brings a whole different side of expertise that we don't have. Um, and then um, secondly, seeking out people who young people find compelling. So we've just started working with a choir leader who I saw this amazing choir perform and I saw the leader and thought that person's amazing. I want that person in our school. I managed to find him on Facebook and sent him a message and he couldn't do it forwarded me on to someone else who also couldn't do it, who then forwarded up me on. And three phone calls later, I'm talking to this amazing woman who I never would have met otherwise and who our children adore and who actually got is a, is a gospel singer. And we've never had gospel singing here before and our children are really enjoying it. And then I suppose looking at your offer, what are you really good at and where are the gaps, which is obvious. Um, and then this one I found really important as well, signing up to all the mailing lists. So depending on where you are in the country, finding your concert halls and your musical organizations and all the professional ones, many of whom who do have an education wing and getting yourself on the mailing list so that when something does come out, you know straight away and can respond. Um, and then um, I suppose this last one is just about what enables the rest of it to happen, which is about selling the benefits because sometimes we've got brilliant ideas, haven't we, as music teachers. And now I'm really lucky because I'm in the position of being deputy principal and leading music and so I can say yes to myself but um, I definitely did my time of trying to persuade leadership teams to let us do brilliant music and I really believe that this is part of our role as music leaders to, to sell the benefits to our leaders above us and to say remember that performance that you saw where all these parents who we haven't managed to get to parents evening before came in because their child was performing or remember that child who used to be um our teachers are really struggling to engage them and then they went to this workshop and remember how they performed and they felt confident that day and we all told them well done and it was the beginning of a change for them i i, I think that narrative we've got to take a responsibility for it in our schools really selling the benefits of what the power of music is and therefore why it's worth spending the money on getting these other people in and diversifying our um, music staff and therefore our music offering schools. That's it from me. Thanks, everyone. Wow, thank you, Emily. I, I first came across Emily because I was doing some work with New and Music um, a little while ago and um, I think you'd had a, a hip hop project or a DJing project or something in your school and we had a conversation about about why it was important yeah we we had um yeah i didn't mention him so he's um he's a grime um mc and he um was like a friend of a friend a friend of a colleague who worked in school and um yeah we'd managed to get him to come in and he was he was incredible he's on radio one at the moment um he's on radio one extra and he's like kind of a big deal in the beginning of grime I definitely could never teach about that I don't have the expertise but it's made a big difference you know there's a whole cohort of children who weren't really engaged in music before but have become engaged in music because of working with him thanks yeah. for the mind Ali. no it was just a really really inspiring story and then we had a long conversation about it and I think um, a lot of the things that you talked about today were, were kind of a synthesis of that conversation about um you know being yourself and recognizing your limitations and what what you definitely bring but what you you can't and all of those kinds of things um emily are you able to hang around um, because what i was going to do was get louise to talk and then go into some breakout rooms to have a chat about the three presentations so far and come back with some questions if that's okay unless anybody's got anything they they want to ask emily right now louise do you want to load up whilst um whilst we do that absolutely brilliant thank you I thought your um, say yes and quickly was um, was really good too. The amount of times I've gone back to things, they've gone, oh no, sorry, it's already full. So there we go. Um, so good afternoon. Um, it's a real pleasure to be with you today um, and to be able to talk about something that I'm very passionate about. Um, my name is Louise Haywood and I'm um, subject leader of music at Smithswood Academy, which is um, a secondary school in um, this um, near Birmingham city centre um, and it's um, an area which um, there's a lot of poverty um, a lot of um, like social um, distress really um, but is um, I just love working there um, and I love singing with our children um, I do feel I need to start with a disclaimer and I do know that singing during this Covid time has been 
difficult, if not impossible, um, at times. Um, and I do think that COVID has allowed us some time to reevaluate our values um, and, and our curriculums. And so I do hope that some of this might be useful um, in the near future. Um, I'm sure that lots of you do have a strong singing culture in your um, schools. Um, but the more I've been researching into this and the more that I talk to other um, music teachers, I'm actually realising that this isn't necessarily the norm. And I was looking at some data last night and in 2015, um, about 46% of secondary schools did no singing um, at all, no choirs, no singing in lessons. Um, and we all know how much music has declined since 2015. Um, and so I would worry about what the percentage is now. So I'm gonna start by why I think singing is so important um, and why we should do it in lessons. So, um, may, why should we sing? Um, well, there's plenty of documentation out there which encourages us to sing. Um, obviously the national curriculum, um, Ofsted reports encourage it. Um, I don't know how this is going to go down. I'm quite glad I'm not in the room, but the model music curriculum um, mentions singing. Um, moving away from because we're told to, it's a really inclusive activity, I think. Anybody can sing. Um, I've had children in my choir, I've had children in my lessons who just growl and by the end they can sing. Boys can sing and it's free, um, which is a real issue for me at my school. Lots of parents and lots of children really want to get into their music, but they just don't have the funds to do it. Whereas singing is free and we've been able to do some amazing things. Um, we have a lot of SENMD in our school um, and they all access their lessons um, easier because we sing. Um, I think that singing helps us with our musical intelligence and our oral ability. It's a very physical thing and I think you can feel an interval, you can feel if it's major or minor if you're singing, which is when we've done singing in school, it's really helped our GCSE um, listening. Um, it's really helped with our fluency of reading notation because I will always just put the sheet music on the screen. Um, I'm playing the piano and singing and all the children want to be the scroller because they get to sit in my swivelly chair, um, but they have to be able to read the music to um, do it. So all of a sudden they're all desperate to learn how to read music. Um, and it just happens very naturally learn to read music and um, when you're singing with it. And the great thing about singing is that you can teach children how to sing and you can teach everything through singing. Um, and so it's great for building cultural awareness and learning about um, different genres um, and just being critically aware and for teaching all of those keywords that have to be um, taught for GCSE. Um, this is um, one of those topics which I could, you know, talk about um, all day um, and I'm obviously confined for time. So I'm just going to talk today about how I do singing in my classroom um, and how that that does go into extracurricular, but I'm just going to stick with my classroom um, today. Um, and the reason for that is because of this lovely quote, if you want something taken seriously in a school, it needs to happen during class time. Um, and I um, know that SLT love hearing the children sing um, and we get a lot of credit um, and a lot of good stuff happens in my department um, because of that. Um, and I, this is just something I live by. If you want something taken seriously in a school, it needs to happen during class time. So, um, singing is hard. Um, and my best advice is that you just have to sing with no fear. Um, and I think when I talk to other music teachers, the reason they don't do singing is because they're worried about singing in front of the children themselves. I've been singing since I was five. I've um, had some amazing opportunities, but if you asked me to sing a solo right now, I wouldn't. I don't think I'm the best singer in the world, but I just have to sing with no fear in that classroom um, and model the confidence that you want. Um, the, to sing and to teach singing well, um, you have to understand young adolescents and their music. Um, and I found this quote by Ashley Marty, which says, that has to be underpinned by an unquenchable enthusiasm that is resilient enough to overcome the fact that school, and certainly school music, is irredeemably by definition not cool. And so I think if you just go in with that enthusiasm and um, confidence, 
you can get away with anything. Um, I've never had a class be rude to me about my singing and I've only ever um, had complete enthusiasm and fun um, with them and it gets easier with time the more you do it. Um, so the children would come into my lesson and normally we sit like around the classroom because that's where the keyboards are but when I sing we sit, sit in a really tight block and um, this is just because it feels so much easier to sing when you've got lots of voices around you and you, it's much harder to hear your own voice when you've got everybody else's voice which helps the children feel more confident i know i probably would get a question what do you do about the children who won't sing um they either will sit right in the middle of the block or they'll sit right in front of me at the front so they've got my voice in front of them and everyone else's voice behind them and they will end up singing and um, because they just feel confident I also um, think that you've just got to praise, praise, praise. So I write all of the children's names on my whiteboard. And in that first lesson, every time they open their mouth, I'll give them a tick. And I say something like, if you get three ticks, you can have a merit. And the children know that I cannot, I'm not allowed to hand out as many merits as I do in their lessons, but I do. And they're all desperate to get ticks. They're, so they're all desperate to get as many ticks and I say if you get nine ticks I'll have to give you three merits and they're like you can't do that and I'm like well I'm going to and so that um, helps. It's also kind of polices itself because when you've got that child who's maybe a bit hesitant um, and I don't give them a tick they're like miss you've missed this person off and I'm just like oh well uh, I didn't notice them opening their mouth but it might be my mistake. Um, and then you'll find that they start to sing because they want as many ticks um, and it helps with those boys because boys just are generally competitive um, and want to get the most ticks. Um, I also don't tell the children that we're going to sing in that first lesson. Um, so I would start my lesson off by just saying we're going to do something a bit different today um, and it's going to help us with our sport because singing um, a lot of the breath control and the physicality is good for sport. Um, I'm a really passionate footballer as well, which the children know. So I talk about how um, what we're going to do has helped me stay on the pitch longer, increased my stamina, um, which the children like. Um, the sw swimmers, it helps them. I've talked about, oh, this will help those of you who want to go into drama with your projection. Um, and I've also said, you know, there will be times in your life when you might have poor mental health or you might feel anxious or panicky. And some of these exercises are going to help you with that. And so the children are all up for this. Um, we then do some stretches. Um, the children are thinking, oh, this um, is helping with my sport. Great. We do some breathing exercises. The children can see that. And um, we talk about sigh running, um, which is really good if you've got a croaky voice, um, better than coughing. Um, and the children, um, you know, take all this in. Um, and then I start to play the piano and I just, we start off with a silly song called I Don't Want to Sing Today. Um, and we just do it through, it's a call and response song. And I start by singing, I don't want to sing today. And the children without realizing it because they've just done all these stretches and breathing and sirening, they just start to sing. And they quite like singing a song which says that they're not gonna do something and then they do. Um, and this just leads into a great lesson of singing. Um, it's gotta be fast paced. Um, lots of fun warm ups. So my favourite one is um, a warm up, which is the William Tell tune, but you sing Bob's got a head like a ping pong ball. And I tell the children that we're going to sing a song which is really offensive and rude and that if they sing it outside this classroom, they'll have to go to isolation. The children are on the edge of their seats. I'm like, it's really rude. Um, I'm sorry if you've got an uncle called Bob. And then um, we sing it and we get faster and faster as it's a tongue twister and they love it. Even when they leave in year 11, they're like, Miss, can we sing Bob's Go Ahead like a ping pong ball? Um, and they just love it. I also think to do singing really well, you have to be careful about your repertoire choices. Um, so children will sing songs that they um, love. I had a real problem. Um, at this in the September to December when I was in school that the children were so used to singing um I had we would I was teaching year nine and we were just in the classroom um, and we were just listening to music and answering questions unfortunately um and they just would not stop singing Beatles Yellow Submarine it was hilarious um because they're so used to it um 
The repertoire choices are also important because teenage voices change. So boys' voices changes and girls' voices change, um, which they don't often know. Um, and children don't like singing if they don't think it sounds good. Um, so you're looking for songs, um, which, especially as they get into year eight and nine, which have about a range of a sixth, because that's um, best when um, their voices are changing. Um, a mixture of um, genres is um, good. Um, and again, it's just all got to be done with confidence. Um, I have found that these strategies have led to a really healthy singing culture in my school, which has then led to a really healthy and happy department. Um, I think that singing is going to be really important um, in the recovery and um, the curriculum. And um, I'm really passionate that I want to see more of it um, in schools um, and outside of schools. Um, and it's been a real pleasure to um, speak to you all today. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Louise. And um, when we were chatting recently, you were saying how passionate you were about singing. That really comes over in, in the detail that you put into, you're thinking about it and you're doing it. And yeah, I love that, um, that ping pong ball. I've used that quite a few times. It's always really, really popular. I just wondered if you use um, voice at all in um, any of the creative and composing kind of um, work that you do and whether it, it kind of translates into any of that side of your curriculum. Um, so I do find that because I do that singing module um, very early on in year seven, it then um, just stems. So we do sing when we're doing listening. Um, so we'll, like, for instance, in year eight, we do um, Johnny Be Good to talk about how blues and rock and roll are very similar, but we'll sing Johnny Be Good. Um, and a lot of key stage four compositions right at the start, a lot of them will choose to sing rather than um, play. Um, yeah. I think they just find it so much easier um, and there's less barriers for them. Yeah, and it gets out of your head what's already in there and sometimes putting an instrument or a computer in the way can, can be the barrier um, to that in some ways. Um, I can see George in the background there with Stella as well. So when we break out into breakout rooms for a minute, um, there'll actually be 16 of us, but um, what we're gonna do is we're gonna go out into some rooms for around, um, We'll come back together by half past four, if that's OK, Maria. So we're just going to go into a, a group of um, three or four and um, just, you know, introduce yourself to the people there and generate some questions, actually, or some comments that you want to give back to um, to Nick and to Louise. Unfortunately, Emily has been called off. The life of an assistant principal is such um, that uh, she has something to go and deal urgently with. But uh, Maria, so if you could deal um, with that for us and then um, actually we'll, we'll give it about seven minutes if that's all right Maria and hopefully yeah, sure. some rooms uh, will pop up. So the invitation should just pop up on your screens in one second. Okay thank you. Um, excellent, thank you. Um, we're going to go to James, who's going to talk to us. I, I've known James a little while now. He did the PGC at Sussex and then he hung around and he did a master's as well. And now we finally kicked him out and he's gone somewhere else and he's doing a PhD. Um, so uh, it's really great to welcome James today, James Leverage. Um, he's going to talk about some things to do with his master's research, which is students' perceptions of their school music lessons. So over to you, James. Great, thank you very much, Ali. Hopefully you can hear me and see what I'm sharing with you okay? All good. Good, okay. So yeah, um, thanks for the introduction, Ali. So I teach at Brampton Manor Academy in Newham and the presentation that I've got for you today is based on research that I did as a student at the University of Sussex. Um, I should stress as well that the research was based on a school which I'm going to keep anonymous for today um, and it's it's an academy in East London. So the project itself. So I decided to research year eight students. Um, I'll explain some of the reasons why in in a moment, but it's, it's essentially it was because 
in the school that I was researching, year eight marked the point in that students were taking their options. So it was sort of a prime time to, to understand their perceptions of the curriculum because it was the time in which they were either deciding to specialise or kind of discontinue with music. The project itself consisted of a literature review, which I'm going to talk a little bit about, as well as collecting data on students' prime, music, prime musical experience and their attitudes to school music. Um, and in terms of the rationale for the project, it was kind of inspired by reading a lot and kind of hearing a lot about a problem with school music going on in schools, kind of problems with motivation. Um, and I intended to understand the extent to which this problem affected the research context. I wanted to look into how this school could perhaps research, uh, use, use the research to improve their curriculum, um, as well as looking into differences between students of different levels of musical experience and the extent to which um, perhaps students who were more musically experienced were favoured or had more positive perceptions in the curriculum. So planning the project led to my research questions, which I'm going to come back to a little bit later. Um, but I'm going to start off by just talking about some of the key literature um, that I came across when um, carrying out the research project. So firstly, just to kind of include a little quote from the national curriculum. The national curriculum says that we should engage and inspire pupils. And it also has this statement that we should develop a love of music and their talents as musicians, which, which I think is quite interesting. Um, in terms of some of the sort of context of the time, I think this was mentioned a, a little bit earlier on. I think Louise was talking about some of the decline that's happened over the last five years in her presentation. But um, these are kind of findings from, I think, a report that Ali was involved in and uh, published by the ISM. So the report found that accountability measures such as the EBAC were really having an adverse effect on curriculum, um, the problem with the reduction of key stage free music, um, carousels and reduced curriculum time. Um, the statistics, which I'm sure many of us are familiar with, and it's still looking um, as if perhaps COVID is, is going to continue to have quite a negative impact on this, but falling entries for GCSE and A-level A music, um, the kind of decline of subject specialists. Um, I think this point is, is also reflected in, a, in an MU report, but essentially, you know, there's a real link between um, financial background and access to music education, particularly um, kind of instrumental lessons. So students who are from disadvantaged lessons are far less likely to, to have access to music beyond school and, and outside that environment. And finally, in the research, which was quite interesting, was reading about the postcode lottery and mu music provision um, in primary schools. I'm going to come back to that um, point later on when I talk about some of the findings from my research. So something which was really influential for myself was the way in which I talk about well, and think about curriculum. And before this project, my understanding of curriculum was very much in the traditional sense, but I kind of thought of curriculum in the way that Pollard and Triggs describe as the official curriculum. So this idea that a curriculum is a kind of written document. But reading about curriculum, I kind of found um, Pollard and Triggs's explanation, which thinks of curriculum as, as several layers. So as well as the official curriculum, they talk about there being a layer of curriculum called the observed curriculum. So perhaps um, what's actually seen to be taking place. So maybe it may be another teacher observing it going on in the classroom. But as well as that, we've got the hidden curriculum. So everything that it, that's learned that is not necessarily in the official documentation. So it may also include things that happen maybe at lunchtime, um, outside of school, or maybe just kind of learning that's going on in the classroom that's not actually kind of included in written documents. But then the most important layer for myself is thinking about the layer which is the curriculum as experienced. And this is essentially the areas of the curriculum that children meaningfully engage with because it's you know, all well and good having our schemes of work well-written and our documentation, but actually the real layer which is actually having impact on students is, is the one which is really important to understand. Um, so from that, I think a really interesting way of thinking about curriculum is that it's this dynamic phenomenon. So 
rather than just being a kind of fixed static document, kind of thinking about curriculum in terms of the interactions and relationships we have with learners, um, as well as this kind of relationship between teachers, learners, and what there is to be learned. And I think it's a really interesting way to think about curriculum. And, you know, I think it really kind of can change the way that we sort of go about our practice. And I think it's all about thinking about how we're actually approaching um, teaching in the classroom, rather than just thinking about, you know, written plans, written documentation, just really kind of thinking about our actions. So that's kind of some of the literature about curriculum. I also looked into musical identities, which are really interesting. And it was really interesting hearing um, some reflections from Emily on identities as, as well as um, Louise a little bit as well. But our musical identities, we're kind of split into two parts. So it might be that we think about identities in music. So kind of maybe us as teachers describe ourselves as a musician or a composer. Um, for me, I sometimes call myself a music teacher, sometimes a percussionist, maybe in this context, a researcher. Um, but essentially, everyone has a concept of their musicality. And um, even I think on Friday last week, I, I was in a taxi and speaking to the taxi driver about music and his musical identity, he presented himself to me as the music connoisseur. And he had lots of kind of really interesting opinions that, that he spoke about. But essentially, the idea of having an identity in music is fairly universal, whether it be, you know, I'm completely tone deaf, or, you know, I'm a first violinist in, in the London Symphony Orchestra. Also, sometimes music might be used in terms of people's overall self identities. So in terms of why they're important, between five and 14, children's musical identities develop at school. And, you know, this, this idea in kind of secondary school of year seven and eight, I think really presents a golden opportunity in, in terms of if we can engage those kids in year seven and eight and get them to think about themselves as musical, they're far more likely to see themselves as studying music. Whereas if in those initial kind of years of key stage three, or maybe even at the latter stages of primary school, if they're switched off by music, potentially they're gonna decide that music's not for them. And it may mean that it's gonna be very difficult to engage them in the classroom or kind of engage them in further study. Also, I think what's quite interesting is a range of influences on musical identity itself. And I think a lot of us will probably um, recognize some influences on our own kind of musical backgrounds. Um, for me, family being a big one, um, but also kind of, you know, educational environment. I think the environment we create in schools is really important to kind of developing musical identities, um, as well as whether it be friends, um, self-belief, a few different um, explain that. But anyway, I'm going to move on now and I'm going to talk about the findings of my research itself. So this is based on a survey um, of students in, in the school that took place. So I managed to find out that in the school, schools have fairly positive perceptions of the curriculum. They really valued being uh, having opportunities to be creative and make practical music. Um, although in the literature, it's sometimes discussed that boys have a maybe a lower perception of music than girls in this particular research uh, context. This wasn't the case. Um, in terms of kind of what students valued in the curriculum, they valued opportunities to express themselves creatively. They really valued engaging in practical projects and practical music over which they had ownership. Um, later on, I'll talk about kind of some of the opportunities there to kind of look at some of the continuity in the curriculum. In terms of were they influenced by prior musical experience, well, what was quite interesting was the real wide range of musical experience in the school that I was researching. I'll talk about that in a moment. Um, a real kind of postcode lottery of primary music provision. Um, what's interesting, I think a lot of the time, this is kind of something related more to rural areas, but in this research, in the inner city, there was a real kind of divide in what students had studied at primary. Um, so students participation in musical opportunities outside of school was very limited. Um, and there was a favoring of the musical experience and they were more likely to pick music at the end of year eight. So just a quick few slides 
on some of the findings in a little bit more detail, but this shows across the 22 participants the real spread in access to whole class ensembles. So some students had access to three projects each, um, some had one project each at primary school, and then a few just had no, no access at all, and a real kind of wide range of instruments there. Um, so I think the implications for this particular slide is that it's, it can be really difficult at secondary school in year seven, catering um, for all of these different levels of musical experience and kind of, you know, um, engaging and motivating people from a wide range of backgrounds. Um, in terms of in this particular research context, the majority of them didn't have any uh, music lessons outside of school, um, not necessarily just through lack of opportunity, but maybe lack of choice as well. So I think there are some implications there for the curriculum in that particular school in terms of, you know, improving access. I'm going to whisk through these just because I'm probably coming towards the end of my time, but students really valued um, being able to be creative in the curriculum, practical music, having ownership of their work, and they really valued um, having positive relationships with their teachers, um, something that I think was um, also reflected on in some of the other presentations today. If students were able to change something, they wanted more time for music. Um, they wanted more support, which is obviously difficult in the classroom setting. Um, they wanted opportunities to have more choice in their lessons. Um, some of them felt as if their peers weren't engaging enough, um, which is quite interesting. In terms of whether they were taking music as an option, some of the key um, influences on them were their parents, their future ambitions, whether they thought music was fun or not, um, whether they kind of had the self-perception of themselves as good at music or not so good at music, as well as their religion. So I'm just going to kind of get to the implications of my research and whisk through these. But essentially, I think that um, in my own practice, this research has made me really reflect with this idea of the curriculum as experience. And I think understanding the connections that children make with their lessons is just really important to improving the experience um, and ensuring that music is accessible. I think also considering ways in which um, the primary and secondary music link can be really important, um, not just in kind of musical development, but also in the way that they kind of develop their musical identities. Um, and also just kind of considering how to remove or reduce the effect of barriers to music education. And this comes down to the finding that we um, found in this research context that students from more musically experienced backgrounds were more likely to take music. So I think um, considering how to remove those would be really important. So in terms of my research project itself, it came up with three recommendations um, for educators that I want to share with you. Um, so I think just the importance of forming an awareness of students' prime musical experience, ensuring that music is inclusive of all students, regardless of their backgrounds, and ensuring students are in a positive learning environment. Um, I did come up with a curriculum model, which I'm not really going to have so much time to talk about now. So maybe may, maybe another time, but I'm going to leave you with that. Um, and essentially, these are kind of the idea is that the curriculum model is based on the kind of music teacher being the operator and kind of um, considering all of these different kind of channels as part of the curriculum. Um, and essentially kind of based on this idea of music as a dynamic phenomenon, um, kind of emergent from the interactions of teachers and students, um, which is the quote from Cook and Spruce from earlier on. So I think um, that's probably my time up, but thank you very much for, for listening. Thank you, James. There is so much in your research. I know it quite well. Having read it, um, and it's just brilliant to to hear you being able to kind of synthesise that um, and being able to kind of uh, you know open up so many questions for us. I think as educators that we really really need to think about, and the idea of curriculum as experienced being absolutely crucial to um, going forward. Really, I don't know if anybody's got any questions for James. I think probably James, you're likely to get questions afterwards <laughs> on that when people have had time to probably digest a little bit. Yeah. Um, with some of the things you've been talking about there but um these things have come up again and again today haven't they authenticity engagement progression ownership relevance and the whole thing around if you haven't got an environment um which supports that where children feel that they can 
you know be authentic take risks and all of those kind of things then then obviously you know that's one of the key drivers so that's brilliant we're um going to move on to janetta um who's going to give us our final presentation for the afternoon thank you so much james just so much to think about in there um and please do direct any questions to james um because i'm sure you know even just even if they're just questions as, as kind of questions to chew the fat on i think it's a really important topic um, especially right now with all the curriculum redevelopment and the focus on curriculum going on. So I'm going to introduce you, Maria, if you want to stop the recording for me. Um, so um, I don't know um, if there's any questions for Janetta, I'm sure we can also pass those on afterwards. I'm, I'm acutely aware that we've literally just hit five o'clock. Um, but before we finish, we finish today, I wanted to say, firstly, a thank you to um, the ISM Trust uh, for um, putting on the event and to Maria, if you want to just take your um, microphones uh, off of silence, I think also if we don't mind giving a quick round of applause to Emily, to Nick, to Louise, to James and to Janetta. Um, and I'm sure there's going to be questions coming afterwards and comments coming afterwards too. So thank you so much guys for, um, for sharing that and um, do keep in touch and let us know um, how the work goes you know what what you're doing next um things you can share go and look at some of those things that list imagine composed stuff in particular that's just come up there at the end is something we haven't really had time to discuss but um thank you so much um half term nearly gin and tonic time now so um hooray off we go and i'll see you see you all soon hopefully all right